Then we'll turn to our speaker for today, who's Alexander McCleary, and she's going to talk about Ayer Memorias, archaeological evidence of land use patterns at the Pueblo de Abacu. Thanks. Thank you, Rosemary. So I should just say that I teach right after at one o'clock. <laughs> so this is going to be a very, very, yeah, very short, very short brown bag, but there's a lot to get through. So I'm just going to go ahead and start. But I will be talking slightly more fast than I should. Um, but anyways, so yes. So the Hinisero Pueblo de Abiquiu was established as a land grant to approximately 20 Hinisero Indian families by the Spanish crown in 1754 in the northern frontier of the Spanish Empire. The term Hinisero describes Native American youths and their descendants who were captured and sold into indentured servitude in Hispano homes. Abiquiu, along with other Hinisero land grants such as Belen and San Miguel de Vado, represented a unique experiment in Spanish colonial policy. It was a compromise between racially motivated ideologies that ordinarily prohibited persons of non-Spanish descent from land ownership and the Spaniards' desire to maintain their precarious existence in the northernmost frontiers of their empire. Um, Hinisero Indians embodied this compromise as indigenous, baptized indigenous persons living in Spanish communities. Uh, the arrangement was favorable to the Spanish colonial government, as I mentioned, um, as Hinisero land grants were purposely placed in buffer areas between Spanish allied Pueblo settlements and hostile nomadic tribes. Despite the constant threat of raids, land grants of this nature were also, to a certain extent, desirable to Hinisero families as it granted them vecino or landowning status. Tactical performances of Hispanic culture by Hiniso individuals were deployed for the purposes of defending their legal claims to environmental resources uh, for maintaining uh, Hiniso uh, status over time. Furthermore, the development of pre-existing ties to other indigenous communities allowed for the development of trade relationships with otherwise hostile indigenous groups through networks of kinship and trade. Anglo-American incursions in the, from the mid-19th century onwards brought yet another level of economic and political entanglement. The annexation of New Mexico by the U.S. in 1846 represented a considerable shift in the racial politics of the region. In contrast to the Spanish colonial racial policy ideology of the Sistema de Casta, the ideological tendency of Anglo-Americans tended to confound race and culture. This reality, together with the desire to possess as much land as possible, provided the U.S. with the motivation to circumvent the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and nullify communal land holdings previously recognized by the Spanish and Mexican governments in New Mexico, um, including those of, uh, of Abiquiu. The Americans justified their policy with the assertion that Hiniso Indians were, quote, half-breed Indians. They assigned this term because the Hiniso Indians adopted several elements of Spanish culture, including language and religion, and were therefore not eligible for the same legal protections afforded to their um, neighboring uh, Pueblo Indians. The term Hiniso has also carried negative um, misogynistic connotations uh, in, the, in the Spanish New Mexican world, uh, and thus was not a term by which persons of Hispano, um, Indo-Hispano descent might have self-identified. Despite these complications, Abiquiu has been unique in its ability to remain a corporate entity while retaining most of its communal lands. The community is currently undergoing a period of cultural re revitalization, and many current and former Hinisero communities look to Abiquiu as they continue to strategize for the preservation of their land grants and communal culture. So this dissertation is part of a community-mandated project to increase our knowledge of the history of the Hinisoas of Abiquiu and to contribute to the efforts to renew local interest in Hinisoa heritage. So, um, so community involvement um, in this project um, has occurred really at every, every stage of the process, including but not limited to the development of research questions, methodologies, and locating excavation sites. Um, so one of the ways that uh, we do this is um, by making ourselves, uh, well first of all it's uh, um, uh, my project goes under the umbrella of the Berkeley Abiquiu Collaborative Archaeology Project, um, which other archaeologists uh, at Berkeley are involved in, including notably Professor Jensen Terry. Um, and so one of the ways that we really try to make this um, truly a collaborative process was uh, to make ourselves uh, very visible to the community um, and at the various stages of, these pro of the process. This is a, a copy, I know you can't read it, 
of um, little postcards that uh, I distributed um, in advance of beginning excavations uh, with Q and A's, uh, my contact information, my mug shots, you know, so I'd be readily identifiable. Um, some questions. Um, also, a stipulation that this was a, a community-based project, and any any uh, member of the uh, Abiquiu community had the authority to to stop us from working um, if they considered our presence problematic. Uh, we uh, had really daily interactions with members of the community at our sites. Uh, we reported to the uh, the community on site um, as the the field school progressed, the excavations progressed. So you can see a flyer that was distributed um, on site. And another thing was, uh, and one of the concerns of the community elders was uh, to ensure that um, Abiquiu youth were being involved in the project. And thanks to funding secured by, um, by June, we were able to uh, pay young Abiquiu students for their labor as they uh, learned basic excavation skills. So this was a, um, a big selling point. And another th um, a thing that we agreed to do um, as a part of a BACA project was to conduct ground penetrating radar um, on, the, on the sites before excavating. Um, this was mostly to ensure that we would not um, accidentally uncover human remains. Uh, it also, of course, helps us target particular areas for excavations. But running GPR well in advance of excavation proved to be um, a kind of blessing because it allowed us to um, have time to make our presence known in the Pueblo, uh, that folks could uh, recognize our faces and ask us questions, um, and to encourage dialogue and um, identify any potential sources of conflict in advance of actual um, excavation. And this turned out to um, to have happened. Uh, there was a, a bit of a snafu during our GPR trips, one of the GPR trips. Um, I had originally planned to excavate in a particular location of the plaza very close to where the 2014 excavation occurred. So right, right here was my original area that had been approved by um, the, the board at Abiquiu, the community board. Um, as it turned out, the small area of the plaza had three separate owners and its own share of concerned neighbors. Uh, so right before we were uh, to begin our GP, GPR work, literally the, the day we came on site, one of uh, the property owners backed out, um, which was un unknown to us. But um, and one of uh, our community partners actually informed me at, at when I got on site. And so, but immediately, multiple uh, families came forward and um, uh, came forward and offered their properties, you know, for uh, the purpose of excavation, which was um, very, very heartening. Um, on the, that same trip, as we started working on the last site, the largest one, AVQ3, that you see in blue, it doesn't look the largest on that, that map, um, uh, which is an area that's very visible from the plaza. One person actually uh, did uh, approach that at a distance and made it very clear that you know they um, did not want us uh, on site and you know sort of yelled us from a distance to to leave. And I, I tried to explain you know what I was doing, introduce myself, but you know it was uh, dialogue wasn't there. So the, complicated, the story gets a bit more uh, complicated, um, but long story short, we did stop working. Um, we pulled out the grid um, just that we had just finished preparing, and uh, yeah, and sort of prepared to pack up and go home. But as I was doing that, I Im immediately started texting some of uh, my friends in the Pueblo to tell them what was going on. <laughs> and uh, the air was, be, uh, was able to be cleared quite quickly of the, the situation. It was really just a, a misunderstanding. Um, and as soon as you know, somebody said, "Don't you? D this is Alexander, you know, <laughs> Jean Student, Baca." And it's like, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah." You know. And then you know, we, um, yeah, it was all was well. But uh, it was during that sort of little uh, exciting interlude that I got um, <laughs> uh, that uh, that inspired the title of this talk, or part of the title for this talk. Ayer Memorias. One of the property owners uh, was consoling me during this time, you know, as we were waiting to, to work things out. 
He's like, you know, so calm down, come you know, it's like, oh, because I, you know, was freaking out a little bit. Uh, and he's, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll teach you, a, I'll teach you a, a saying in Spanish. You can practice it. And he wrote it down, and it said, ayer memorias, mañana sueños, hoy la chingada, <laughs> which I will not translate. Okay. <laughs> uh, so as a way of explaining the situation. So I, uh, it really resonated with me, not just because it sort of humorously expressed my current sentiment, but it also had a temporal dimension to it, you know, and evoked memories of Abiquiu in years past, the challenges it faced and continues to face, and also its hope for the future. And so as I move on to, you know, the clear segue to thinking about, you know, what, what was Abiquiu like in the past? What were the experiences of its inhabitants, who come from diverse ethnic backgrounds, yet share in a common history of colonial trauma as a result of slave trade and precarious social economic positioning on the lower rungs of Spanish colonial racial hierarchies? Um, how is Abiquiu constituted? How might we understand the lived experiences of its residents? Um, what social relationships are expressed through the consumption of foods and goods? How do these differ based on their occurrence in larger communal gatherings or fiestas during which the community might come together in celebration of a common history and identity as abicuseños versus a more private and familial setting? How do they organize themselves and project the image of a sino or landowner status? How do they organize themselves from the very real threat to the security of their families and livestock? The excavations of 2016 gives us the means through which we can begin to answer these questions. So the rest of my talk will be just uh, introducing you to some of the sites that we excavated in 2016. So uh, this is um, yeah, a, map, a general map of Abiquiu. You can see the plaza area. I don't have a laser pointer, I apologize. Uh, on the top right area of the corner. And you can see just at the um, the southern end uh, of the, the CTA, part of the land grant, um, you can see the location of Abbey Q1. Here's a bit of a close up. So it's located just at, um, the, our survey area is located just at the base of this uh, southern boundary wall that uh, encompassed Abiquiu. And there were, and is now actually located within an orchard, which is, and also was a little uh, area for some uh, livestock and was gated off. And so that's why the survey area was so small because uh, we couldn't really get around everything else that was there. But uh, there was an oral history, um, uh, oral historical tradition that suggested that there was a torreon or a watchtower uh, in this location. So we thought it would be interesting to, to explore that possibility. It's certainly located in the right place, right, right at the southern boundary wall, um, exposed to an area through which um, raiding parties might come through. And, uh, you know, the GPR informed where we were working. Uh, we didn't find, um, unsurprisingly, uh, the foundations of the, the, the Torreon. We found um, a potentially wall-like feature located there. Um, so it's kind of uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it's just a close up of that, and we did find you know a couple. There weren't many artifacts, but we found a couple that were like, hmm, yeah, this is interesting. We can start to construct a narrative around you know lack of lack of artifacts and and presence of um, lithic arrows. This is a, a torreon that's. Um, located away from Abbey, but, but close to it. So these are, you know, would have been very large structures. Okay, moving on to Abbey 2. Um, so this uh, Abbey 2 is a location of a small casita, a small house. Uh, that had the reputation of being one of the older buildings in the Pueblo. It was built using the Hakal structure, which is uh, wooden beams set close together and then covered in clay. It's a much quicker way to build um, a, a structure than um, using adobe brick, so they usually put up first. We had a couple good historical photos to help guide our, um, our excavations as well, the location of our units. Um, so this is actually a picture to the right of what the structure looked like in the early 20th century. And here's just a, a map rendering of the site. And uh, so that, that's that portion, right? <laughs> that's uh, still extant. This portion 
is actually that portion that part of the, the room block uh, is no longer standing and right in between somebody had built around the tw uh, 30s and 40s that we can see in some other historical photographs we can see uh, somebody added an additional room constructed out of adobe brick so uh, we decided to try to find the Hakal structure which we were um, able to uh, it actually this map is incomplete the the Hakal did go through c2 and c3 as well you can see a close-up here featuring Danny Sosa <laughs> And uh, what was interesting about the site is that we um, we were trying to understand how this this area was formed. I was looking for artifact concentrations around the casita that would suggest um, you know, uh, refuse discard, but really didn't find any. It was um, lack of lack of artifacts other than what we'd find right at the surface. Uh, what we found instead was a, a prepared surface around the front of the house. Uh, larger rough cobbles were placed on top of sand and then packed down with clay and that surrounded um, the outside the portion of the of the casita. And you can anyway th I don't know why I put that in there. Oh so that, anyway I'm not going to go through that. <laughs> I'm, I'm short on time. Uh, we also did some dendrochronology um, at the request of the landowner who was interested to know exactly when this house uh, dated. Unfortunately, we couldn't get um, dates for most of the um, most of the wood samples that we were able to take. Uh, the ones that we did get dated to 19 uh, were cut in 1915, but notice that they're all uh, a, a type of uh, pine tree, whereas the other ones are juniper. So it would suggest that these uh, were uh, newer replacements um, that, were, that were brought in. So it doesn't, I don't think it indicates at all that this house was constructed around 1915. So anyway, moving on to the last site that we excavated, MQ3, another close up. So this last area is quite close to the plaza, but not directly on it. It's actually a, l a race a little bit uh, in elevation from it. Um, the survey area is located on a clearing behind a currently uninhabited structure known as Lala's House. Uh, you can see from the historic yes, you can see from the historical photo both the house and the clearing, which appears to contain some trees. That's right. So that's the house, and those are the trees. Uh, let's see. So there, in the, the photo, you can see other houses uh, along the same area, the same row as the as uh, Lala's house, but those aren't um, contiguous with Lala's house, and they are not standing today. We did a, a GPR survey of the area. Um, the GPR suggested a rectilinear pattern on the southwest corner of the survey area, which um, might suggest, well, might have suggested a structure no longer visible to the surface, which was kind of exciting. Uh, so we decided to uh, explore those. Um, I won't talk about test trench one, but I guess I will. Um, we decided to excavate a, s a very skinny, it's skinnier than it looks like on, on this map, after a conversation with one of the neighbors when they said they remembered um, a, a privy located to the northeast, not the northwest of uh, the area. And um, I decided to assuage my panicky fear so that I'd somehow gotten my GPR map back to front. Back, back to front. Uh, <laughs> They're digging in the wrong place. Um, so we decided to do some ground truthing, and sure enough, we found it immediately. So we know that you know this, the map is, in fact, uh, located where it should be. Uh, nevertheless, unfortunately, um, we were not able to find a structure. I don't know if you can see it from the back. It's a little hazy, but this kind of pattern here. So not, not a structure. It's quite clear that the area had been used as a trash deposit for quite some time. So those uh, rectilinear patterns you're seeing here are mostly artifact concentrations. Um, so the bad news is that we were getting uh, Budweiser bottles at 40 centimeters below surface. Um, the good news is that we were also getting um, a high concentration of artifact that suggest earlier deposits as well in different locations at the site. Okay, so 
how am I doing? Okay. So very preliminary artifact analysis. Uh, very, very preliminary. Um, we did, of course, find more artifact categories than these four at the site. This is just what I was able to uh, enter into um, our database for now. Um, but it already kind of shows you some, uh, some uh, differential patterning at, at these sites. So you can see that ABIQ3 has a much higher concentration of artifacts than the other two sites in general. There's a lot more fauna, which is not apparent from this graph, but there are also, oh, sorry, there's supposed to be a end of sentence there. So there's a lot more fauna. What's not apparent from this um, graph is that there are a lot more botanical remains there. A lot of what appear to be cherry pits to me. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if we could figure out um, what, what species of, of pits we're seeing. Um, It'd be also interesting to see if you know we can um, explore um, developing um, a horticultural heritage project at ABIQ and seeing if we can replant some of these trees. If you, there are a lot of historical maps of ABIQ that show orchards around, so it'd be kind of cool to explore that. Um, you can see that ABIQ2 here has uh, fewer artifacts than ABIQ3, uh, much more glass and proportionately more metal. Um, these, for the most part, were found very close to the surface. I know that's not reflected in this graph, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, so this, this suggests that only after the house became inhabited, the casita became uninhabited, that it basically started to accumulate litter, but m much fewer artifacts there. Um, comparing ABIQ 2 and 3 shows us that uh, how folks at ABIQ tended to dispose of their trash. They tended to do it behind their homes, away from view. Um, this is certainly not true of all historical sites at New Mexico. At, uh, from those, I remember now why I put that other historical photo. Uh, you can see a lot of historical photos that the, the puzzle looks very clean. Um, there doesn't look like there are a lot of heaps of trash around. And I actually had some conversations with uh, some community members about how privies tended to be quite far away uh, uh, from the houses themselves. So there, there was this kind of interest in uh, cleanliness and hygiene and, and appearances. Um, and certainly not true of all, uh, all sites in New Mexico. And uh, I think a, uh, an argument might be made regarding the, the performativity of vecino status um, that pushes against the racial stereotypes of Haniso behavior. So ABIQ1 has considerably less artifacts, most of which are ceramics, most of which, again, you'll have to take my word from it, um, are Biscuit A from the pre-European contact Pueblo, which occupied the same general area. Um, I find it interesting that we don't find nearly as much colonial era ceramics uh, in ABIQ1, which suggests that um, if this was the site of the, the Torion, and I do believe it's the, the general location from it, I'm not going to get into why, um, it would, uh, the adobe bricks that would have um, uh, been constructed for the Torion would have dated close to the foundation of the Pueblo in 1754, before colonial ceramics would have been incorporated into the adobe matrix the way that you see it uh, elsewhere in ABIQ. And boy, do you see it. Okay, so there's um, a lot more to be said about the fauna, of course. Uh, I'm very interested in the fact that we're seeing mostly caprines in our faunal assemblages across these sites, which again gives us a clue that a significant portion of our assemblage does in fact come from um, uh, prior to the 20th century. Um, so we are able to get a diachronic perspective on these sites. Um, so the, also a note um, to compare these sites to the 2014 excavations, the ceramics that we're uh, finding tend to be various kinds of plane wares, which uh, uh, we're seeing significantly less of the fancier polychrome ceramics that were brought in from other pueblos, um, as we saw in the 2014 excavation right along the plaza. So we're seeing discrete activity patterning, patterning throughout our sites, uh, which is very nice. And that concludes my brown bag. Mm -hmm. I assume you're open to some questions? Yes, I have nine minutes for questions. <laughs> yes. That's great. So, so out there, I mean, you're talking about that there's an earlier pre-colonial occupation. So how tough is it to actually discriminate 
pre-colonial from the colonial. Is it is it that market, or is there actually a, a lot of materials that would actually be a transition between the two? And how how early is that pre-colonial? Is it right before Attitude, or is it? Much, much earlier. It's it's a few hundred years okay. earlier. Okay. Um, there there is this narrative that Abiquiu was built on an older Pueblo site, and we definitely um, uh, Abiquiu is the, the the type site for a particular kind of ceramic biscuit. Uh -huh. A um, and you see it everywhere. Yeah. You really do everywhere uh, in Abiquiu. Um, I was worried when I was, uh, saw that rectilinear pattern in the GPR at ABIQ3, I was worried that you know, this might be potentially associated with that early Pueblo because mm -hmm. the fact that uh, we saw that patterning um, so well, uh, relatively deep beneath the surface, yeah. right? Uh, I was thinking that you know, maybe that, that would be the case, but it, it wasn't. So the, the, the funny thing is, is that we have not been able to locate yeah any features, as far as I know, around the plaza? Maybe June would disagree, no? Not, not plaza around Abiquiu. Yes, yeah, yeah, other, other places around Abiquiu, yeah. certainly. Uh, but not actually where the, the Pueblo is, is located itself. It could be that it's just a different location. Uh, a lot of the community members say that they find the most artifacts uh, around where an old elementary school used to be, okay. which is currently you know, not really occupied. Um, so it could be that we're just digging, that you know, the, the current Pueblo de Abiquiu is located in the area spatially distinct from the older Pueblo. So, but we, we definitely see um, artifacts, particularly ceramics from that, that era. But the fact that we are seeing so many, um, so, so many uh, livestock, so much livestock uh, that were brought in by the Spaniards sure. um, is another, another um, fact that convinces me that we're not just uncovering the, uh, the, the Tewa Pueblo. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I you mentioned the Catherine quotations. Are you seeing uh, diatonic changes in the fauna itself so far? Um, or what patterns? And specifically, do you see, have you seen any forced? Um, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet. Um, I'm really, I've been focused mostly on just processing all the artifacts that have cut, so cleaning them, cataloging them, entering in our database making them available to other research partners that are interested in different, um, uh, uh, different assemblages. So I, I've not been able to, to get to that analysis. It's just uh, yeah. instinct at, this, at yeah. this point and what I've been able to sort of see on a superficial level. I uh, am really actually kind of excited at you know, the um, the, the morphological differences I'm seeing in the, um, the sheep and goats and cattle that we're excavating from Abiquiu and comparing those with our comparative collections at the, um, in the, uh, the Zara Archaeology Lab um, that are coming from California. So I think that it would be really cool to try to uh, locate or identify breeds and seeing change in breeds. I definitely think that you could do that with cow. We're not finding a lot of, of boss, but um, when uh, Anglo-Americans came into the area, they brought with them um, cattle from Texas that is very distinct from the, um, the, tr the heritage breeds that were brought in by the Spanish tend to be much smaller and all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot of potential for very, very um, cool research to be done at looking at diachronic change of livestock and husbandry pa practices and butchery practices. It's just going to have to wait till my next brown bag. What's that? I analyzed that follows the spawn from David. Oh, yeah. Okay. What, did, what did you, you want to uh, share? No, we can talk later. <laughs> okay. Yes. Not, um, I know you just haven't analyzed that, so I'm not asking a question about the baby or baby. I'm asking more about what you're seeing today on the landscape. Would you say that the crops that the people who live in this community, the descendants of the earlier arrivals, have a distinctly different combination of taxa that they grow than, say, their neighbors who either came in earlier or came in later? 
I would not be able to answer that question at all. I, I have not seen any crops being farmed around the immediate area of Abiquiu, and both of June's eyebrows are raised, so I'm sure he'd be able to answer that question they farm. differently. Yeah. They, 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 they do. There's a significant amount of farming. There's a lot of range management for the, the, the uh, pastures for the, for the cattle, but um, yeah, they, they maintain their own heirloom bridles of chili pepper, which they're very proud of. Um, but there's also, um, there's ancestral grid gardens with pre-contact bubbles growing cotton, corn beans and squash and all that stuff. And we've actually um, been working with Glenn Dean to bring some of those crops back in small experimental grid plots. So there's both the pre-contact stuff that Glenn is working on them with, but then there's more of the heirloom, um, corn beans and squash, type of thing. you know, there's the Anasazi beans, but there's also what they call Abaki chili. And that's an important uh, part so of this. And so they are growing essentially Native American species. They're not focusing on the wheats and the barleys that you might associate with uh, Spanish yeah. harassment or oppression. Although the monks at the monastery who are doing uh, the beer down the road mm -hmm. um, are very interested in asking about what varieties of, of Spanish colonial barley mm -hmm. and things might be brought back. Mm -hmm. So that's there's more of that terroir for their beer. Mm -hmm. um, so that is actually a conversation they're having. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not my, my specialty about what they're doing with their food. But there's all those food security initiatives that they're a part of to try mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, the youth and the community's traditional techniques are still being brought back and taught and, and really thought through as part of their, their learning process. Speaking of talk, how are you doing? Oh, yeah. I've, I've got one minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, one minute is a question. Or, a, or two minutes, uh, okay. One uh, question. <laughs> Yes, Chris. Okay. Uh, very briefly, we've gotten a little preview of more artifact analysis, but uh, what, what are the next steps? Uh, next steps for me uh, is to get through that fauna. <laughs> um, we, that's my priority. Um, there are other graduate students and other researchers uh, working on other uh, assemblages uh, as same time as I am. Um, so we have uh, Danny Sos Aguilar, um, who is looking at the lithic assemblage. Oh, he's right there, right there. <laughs> Yay, look at him. Okay. Um, June is looking at the ceramics with Heather Atherton. Um, yep. And uh, I, so there, I guess now it's kind of the, the buckling down stage. Oh, Kirsten, people are pointing at Annie. Right, sorry. Of course, Annie is beginning her project. <laughs> Um, Annie's beginning her, her uh, project uh, this summer at ABIQ as well, and she is focusing on um, the, uh, the water management practices in New Mexico as well. So um, the Baca project is growing, so which is nice to see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much.